Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to the Conscious Life Expo post-conference. I love this expo because we, we bring in some of the top talent around. And the gentleman that I'm going to introduce is one of the people that is definitely tops in his field and has such incredible information to share. So I would like you to join me in giving a rousing Conscious Life Expo welcome to David Wilcox. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. You know, 2012 is about a new birth, and, and now that I have my own umbilical cord, <laughs> we have a great symbolic uh, reference for that. So... This is going to be a bridge where we're going to start with the 2012 Enigma material that I didn't get to finish yesterday because literally we had the line for that room wrapped around two halls in this hotel. It was enormous. How we got all those people into that room, for those of you who remember, I don't know how it worked, but it was, it was a divine miracle in and of itself that we actually got the people in. So this is about what the government is like for most people right now. <laughs> We've gotten into this illusion that the government is our benevolent father figure and protector. And more and more recently now, it's, it's feeling as if, uh, you know, what's the surprise is not what we're expecting. So many people are awakening to cosmic consciousness and uh, higher concepts of metaphysics and spirituality. And this is going to be a true uh, master class in what's really going on. So three years ago, I was at this conference, and I met Billy Blake, who should be here, but he's not here yet. Uh, he's going to be running around with a handheld camera. Um, and we decided to do a film together. The film is called Convergence, as many of you, or probably all of you know. Uh, so that film deals with the idea that the underlying fabric of this universe is consciousness, which is what all the old mystics and all the old religious traditions have been saying for thousands of years. Now... What I offer is a much more elaborate and intricate spin on the notion of a consciousness field than you've probably ever seen anywhere else. Of course, it goes without saying that for those of you who haven't seen this, when they don't, when they haven't seen it before, there's a gasp in the audience, but you all are well initiated. Uh, Edgar Casey and myself, there's obviously a facial similarity there. Uh, this is my brother and Casey's uh, first guy, Dr. Ketchum, who got him out there in the world. My father, after Metallica concert, that's why he's sneering. <laughs> and the squire, Edgar Casey's father. My father would only shop at the squire shop, and everybody called Casey's father the squire. This is my best friend Jude and Edwin Blumenthal uh, from the Casey tradition, one of his uh, principal investors. Jude and I did marvelous uh, music together in high school, at least we thought so at the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is my friend from uh, college, Christopher and uh, his corresponding reincarnation, uh, Morton Blumenthal. This is my good friend from college, uh, Angelica, and this is Edgar's wife, uh, Gertrude. These are like the only people I'm still in contact with from high school and college. I mean, you have to understand, these are not just random people from my life. These are like some of my closest associates and friends. And then when you find out that they're the same people as in Edgar's circle, it's very, very surprising. Okay, so as we went through yesterday, are there great secrets being held? This was uh, something a lot of people didn't catch on the way they did the reflection on the poster for the Da Vinci Code. And, of course, what is the eye in the triangle on top of the pyramid? Uh, is there a message that's being given that we're not fully getting access to? Gore's inconvenient truth, sure, that looks like smoke, not. That looks like a galaxy. And here's the Milky Way from the top down. Uh, there's our sun, so you can see this is about where we are. So we're not all the way out at the edge. We're kind of in the middle. But doesn't this look sort of like crosshairs to sort of point towards the galactic center and suggest that there's some sort of galactic alignment that's going on here? So later in this talk, you're going to hear about interplanetary climate change, which is how this movement into a new area of energy in our galaxy is, in fact, actually causing all the planets in the solar system to experience changes just like the ones we see on Earth. So this is far from an isolated phenomenon. There's also these new physics discoveries that keep leaking out, and they always relate to sacred geometry. The idea, in this case, of the dodecahedron, which is 12 pentagonal faces that kind of looks like a soccer ball if you make it into a sphere. 
They actually found out, uh, these scientists uh, discovered that the background radiation from when the universe was first created has arranged itself into this odd geometric pattern. And that's been proven. So then the question is, okay, what is the force that would cause that type of geometry to emerge in the formation of the universe? As we're going into the 2012 subject, of course, crop circles have been on everybody's mind. This was the formation that came down a couple years ago, which started out in an unfinished way. You notice that all of these blocks are completely solid, and this area is solid as well. Well, the circle makers, whoever they are, came back, and when they came back, this is what we got. Now you have time markings and symbols from the Mayan calendar, okay? And the alignment of these winged disks in terms of what markers they're pointing to, which corresponds to the Mayan system and the Aztec system, gave you an exact time reference of the length of time between when this was created and 2012, the end of the Mayan calendar. So this is a self-referential 2012 diagram given to us by whoever is behind the circle phenomenon. This is uh, one of many crop circles which seems to suggest that the secret to understanding 2012 and this mystery that we're dealing with right here in our talk today is in vibration. That looks an awful lot like a vibrating puddle of liquid. This is what happens when you take vibration to the next step. You get sacred geometry, and I'm going to show you more about that in a second. If you can imagine, this is a sphere and a cube and then another sphere. This is the Froxfield chromosome formation. Obviously, the circle makers are saying, you know, 2012, pay attention to your DNA, right? Except here's the thing. The chromosome's all broken up. And that's what happens before there's about to be a cell metamorphosis. Now, this is even more interesting. Check this out. What does that look like to you? A double helix. Okay, and there's 12 stations. Then down here, you get an even weirder thing. You get a triple helix, but they still have that, that same formation, and then boom, what's this? And look at the timelines. This is less than a month apart in 1999, and this came out in 96. So it appears that there is a message being given about the basic nature of DNA changing somehow. This is another crop formation which shows you DNA very, very clearly. As you can see that it's twisting and you can see the ladder and the helixes. So there's something very interesting going on here. Now this is one of the most staggering formations that's ever come down. And as I said yesterday, the idea that two drunken Englishmen stomped it down <laughs> with a funny hat and a string and board after coming back from the bar one night, it just doesn't fly. This is much too complex to be something that could have been done without an elaborate. And, and you know, the thing is, I mean, these, there have been some cases where formations like this have been documented as showing up within a one hour period. Like somebody's out there at night, they see nothing, and then there's lights and the dogs start barking and everything goes nuts, and then all of a sudden, boom, there it is. So this is showing you the geometry of the tetrahedron, uh, which here's a, a drawing of it. This is the frozen vibration that is one of the principal energy fields that moves through planets, as you can see in this diagram. Uh, it shows up at 19.5, which is Richard Hoagland's thing. He's speaking tonight uh, at 7. Um, so here's your uh, animation of the actual great red spot, which is at the limb of the tetrahedron down here, and Jupiter. And this also extends through the great dark spot on Neptune. This extends through uh, a shield volcano on Mars called Olympus Mons, all throughout the solar system. So here's the secret. This is just a puddle of water that's got ordinary particles of sand in it called colloids. And those colloids are then vibrated on perfect sound frequencies like the white keys on the piano. And what you get is this interesting geometric shape inside, which should look pretty familiar to us by now. So uh, this is the same pile of sand in the same water, just with different sound frequencies. And this is a very important point we're going to get into soon. The fact is that you can crank up the sound to a different frequency and you get the same stable geometry. It stays there. It doesn't move. And when you crank it back down, it goes back to the other shape. So these shapes remain consistent for the given volume of water that you have and the shape of that water, regardless of how many times you change your frequencies. And it's also important to notice that the density of the structure, the density of the geometry gets higher as the pitch goes higher. These are increasing pitches as you go down. So that's a very important point. So what if physical matter was actually built like this? What if this is the secret of physical matter?
could that mean that atoms and molecules as we know them could fundamentally shift? That's what we're looking at. As I was training you into seeing yesterday, is there a parallel reality where space and time flip over, where they invert with each other? And the answer is yes. That's actually what is going on. Uh, does this solve all the basic quantum physics problems? It does. And that's been proven. Goes back to the two-slit experiment where you have single electrons that move through two slits, but then they form an interference pattern of more than two slits on the other side, which is like a wave. So here you have a particle, but over here you have a wave, and you can even have multiple strikes at the same time. So atoms and, and electrons are not little bitty chunks of matter. They're just energy. But they're not behaving the way they should. So here's another diagram of that. This is what a wave does. You, a wave is just like if there was a liquid here, and then it hits this, it ripples like, like two waves on a pond coming together, and that's how you get your interference pattern. So of course, wave-particle duality. Um, what we're discussing now is the idea that a particle is here in space-time. That's where it's uh, fixed in time but can move around in space. But in the inverted world, it can, it's spread out in time. So it's still the same thing. It's just that it's now flipped over into another domain. And in that other domain, it space, spaces out in time, and thus you get this kind of waveform that's created from it. Well, this would all be just kind of an interesting intellectual study until you start looking at larger objects. Now, check this out. This is a little thing called a buckyball or a fullerene. It's uh, carbon molecules, 60 of them put together. Obviously, this is a solid piece of matter. In fact, they're used to store items inside of them. They can be used for, like, uh, disaster cleanups, like oil spills eventually. If they could manufacture enough of them, that kind of thing would be great for that. Well, Zellinger in 1999 took these carbon-60 molecules and shot them at a 100 nanometer diffraction grating, which is a little slit like we showed you before, and he got an interference pattern, which is like a wave. So do you realize what that means? The buckyballs were rolling inside out somehow. They hit that wall, and they turned over. Like, if, have you ever had one of, those, uh, one of those little balloons where you squeeze it in your hand and it goes whoosh? Is everybody with me? That's what seems to be happening with physical matter, and I've heard that from black ops people as well. This is performed in Austria. So this little guy popped into all these waves when he hit the wall because he flipped inside out. Now, what's really interesting about the geometry that we're already showing you, like the geometry at the formation of the universe, is that they also can do this. But they do this in a very interesting way. When these geometries flip inside out, this is the opposite that they form. So when you have the dodecahedron, it forms the icosahedron. The tetrahedron flips into another tetrahedron upside down, and then the octahedron flips over into a cube, and it goes back and forth between those two. Now, here's what's another very fascinating point. We've just seen how the fullerene can burst into a wave. Well, guess what? DNA is almost the same width. Now, just chew on that for a second if you haven't already seen this talk. I mean, DNA is supposed to be a molecule. In fact, the amount of DNA in one cell of your body, if you spaced it out, is five feet long. It's five feet tall. So there's a lot of DNA in there, but if DNA can turn into a wave, then that opens the door to all these quantum non-locality principles. All of a sudden, that stuff becomes real. It becomes true. Well, we already have plenty of experimental evidence, and I'm just going to show you one of them right for now. This is Kaznachiev, a Russian scientist who passed uh, a diseased cell culture through a shield here, which, when it was glass, there was no effect. Of course, the other culture was just healthy tissue. But then when he passed through quartz, the quartz allowed the disease to be transmitted to the healthy cells here. So you have disease to healthy. Well, a virus, again, is a little tiny thing. Most viruses are shaped like geometry. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, a virus can turn into a wave. Okay? So there are some people who believe, for example, that AIDS is synthetic and that you can actually activate the dormant virus with a wave. Uh, it is important to remember that your consciousness has more power than any wave that could ever be beamed at you. So if you ever start worrying about electromagnetic mind control or all these silly things that people get focused on, that's something that you don't need to worry about. Also, uh, has, anybody, has anybody here done healing? Is anybody here? Okay, wow, that's more than half. Have you ever noticed how if you're with somebody and you're really empathizing with somebody who's sick, 
that you start feeling some of the same thing that they've got. There was a case where I had a woman, uh, they were doing a Reiki session on her, and I was in the room, and I started to have this outrageous pain in my big toe. It turns out that she had a gangrenous foot. And the exact spot on my toe that hurt was where the pain was the most strong for her. So this is real stuff. But the thing is, when you get these energetic beamings, unlike this helpless little cell culture, your consciousness has a huge effect on what's going to happen to you. And those little health problems, they don't last very long, right? I mean, usually, if you ever do healing work on somebody, just as a tip, go and wash your hands from the, from the uh, elbows down, because that will get rid of this transmitted energy. Okay, it's a very effective means of doing that. So Dewey Larson, the physicist, uh, revealed that time is, in fact, a three-dimensional domain. And this is where we're getting into the idea of what's over there on the other side when you flip over a particle and it turns into a wave. There's a three-dimensional realm where time, as we know it, is spaced out. Now, okay, not everybody's following me on this, but we're going to go into how this works, so just stay with me. Einstein talked about the space-time fabric, and the basic idea about gravity is that planets are like dipping down in this fabric, and then gravity is just the result of things rolling towards the planet as the fabric is displaced. Well, think about it. If this were true, and all the planets are sitting on top of this fabric, that means that only the fabric and what's above it represents the realm that we live in. But then you got this whole place on the bottom. And where is that? And how do we get there? Well, the answer is you got to punch a hole through. So that's your wormhole, right? You know, the word wormhole comes from the idea of a worm burrowing through an apple. Everybody remember that? And it's like the outside of the apple is space-time. The inside of the apple where the wormhole goes is time-space. That's a three-dimensional realm of time. Time is not linear. It's only linear because we're stuck in space-time. So what happens is time-space time is on the inside of the apple, or the donut in this case, and space-time is on the outside. But this whole system can invert so that space-time is now on the inside and time-space is on the outside. So here's the basics of it again. Three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. You can move around in space, but you're fixed in time. It's moving forward like a river. When you go into time-space, what we would think of as time is now three-dimensional, and what we would think of as space is now one-dimensional you actually move around in three dimensions of time. This is where we're having dreams. This is where we're having astral experiences. That's why a psychic in a particular place can actually look forward and backward in time in that location because they're viewing through time space. That's what your psychic function is. Distance you travel in time space is actually time travel over here. Now, that sounds really far out, but the, the bottom line is all the things that I'm telling you have been verified by multiple black ops witnesses. They've been verified by experimental secret projects, uh, and a lot of actual evidence that's in the public domain that we just don't normally understand what it is or why it's there. The entry and exit points are very important. If you look up in these medieval texts, about fairy circles and fairy rings. These are the little circles you go into where you find the fairies or the gnomes or the dwarves or the elves or whatever. Well, you don't just find them anywhere. You have to go into these circles, and you can only enter them at certain times because it has to have to do with a planetary alignment. You see, the Earth has naturally occurring natural stargates on them. And I know that some of you might not believe this, but there is so much evidence, and we're going to go through some of that. There are natural stargates, and you actually can time travel. So there's a very important reason why the ancients were building things like Stonehenge and the pyramids. This is not just to entertain themselves and to build a tomb for the dead pharaoh. Okay, it's much more than that. So I read this book when I was seven years old, and in the book we have uh, descriptions of experiments in ESP between Harold Sherman, the author, and Sir Hubert Watkins, who was an Ar Antarctic explorer. They documented some fantastic telepathy experiments. In one case, uh, Sherman is sitting there in his, in his room in L.A., and he's tuning into Watkins, and he gets this pain in his head, and it, it hurts a lot. And so he writes down, okay, pain in the head. When we correspond that to what Watkins' journal said at the same time, all the people in his Antarctic expedition team were bumping into this stovepipe that had fallen down with a sharp edge, and they were actually lacerating their head, the skull, it will the, it hit bleeding from that, and he was feeling the pain. Just like I said, there's an energetic transmission. 
of the pain. Well, after Watkins died, the telepathy continued because they were so much in affinity with each other that he could recognize Watkins when he spoke. So Watkins is describing in some of these uh, readings, I guess you could call them, what it took for him to get into Sherman's mind. And he said there was a nested set of spheres that he had to go through. And he had to find a channel to the center to get to the message to Sherman, which was not easy. That's why they call it channeling. Because, and I didn't go into this last time, but what really appears to be happening here is everybody knows about the system of chakras, the esoteric system of chakras. The chakras are actually different levels of your soul and different levels of where your thought processes and consciousness processes are happening. Um, so as you go through these kundalini meditations, the idea is that you're supposed to raise the kundalini serpent. I was shown in multiple readings that the actual process of raising that kundalini is collapsing the chakras together into this set of nested spheres. Because when you do that, you focus everything into the one spot in your brain that we're going to go to here. So this is bringing all your chakras together and then finding that channel so that the, the entity that's trying to reach you or your higher self can get to the center. Because the center is where all the action happens. Why is that? Well, the center of your brain has a small gland in it called the pineal gland, which as you can see here, it was called pineal because it's shaped like a pine cone. This is the exact geometric center of your brain. It's right here. And this, as we're going to see, is very important in ancient cultures. The Sumerians gave it a description, uh, which you can see here, the, the little uh, acorns on the top of the staff that he had. And there's also a little, a little jobber up here. Uh, and what we found out from uh, Dan Burrish is that these can be reversed. The cylinder seals can be flipped over. And when you start doing that, you see some very interesting things like the eye in the triangle, and another eye in the triangle right here. So the Sumerians were hiding information. They were encrypting information in these seals. So this is the one we were just looking at. Here's your little pineal gland, and the other one up there. Well, look at this. Now, if you've seen Stargate SG-1, the first episodes, you remember the Gwauld, the villains in Stargate? You remember how they had these helmets that went around their head that looked like a snake? That's the, that's the helmet. That's the Anunnaki. They were human-like people, but they wore these weird helmets in order to appear like gods to the primitive Sumerians they came to. And this is how they encoded the secret of what they really looked like inside this image right here. It only works when you put a mirror image on it. But then you also see he's holding all these pineal gland staffs, and he's got this, this uh, seal over his head, and more symbols here. But it gets a lot more direct as we go on. And you're going to start wondering to yourself, why in the world are all these cultures focusing on the pine cone? This is Osiris, the lord of the underworld in Egyptian mythology. This is his staff, which as we now know, this is the raising kundalini, the serpent. But it also represents DNA. And there on the top, as the kundalini rises, what are they looking at? They're looking at the pine cone. That's the junction point where all this energy comes together. Now, King Tut has this kundalini serpent actually going through his head. Uh, that's a symbol that they gave, that the pineal is fully activated, that your chakras have now all turned into that nested set of spheres, and that access from the higher realms is moving directly through your head. And they believed he had that. Whether he did or not, we don't know. Here's the Babylonian god, Tammuz. And as you can see, he's holding a pine cone. So once again, this is he's a very powerful uh, god from that tradition and you're seeing the same type of symbolism coming through. Then you go over into Hinduism, the goddess Shiva, the goddess of destruction, the, the breaking down of the old to purify the way for the new. What does her head look like? What does that hair look like? It's another pineal gland. And you've also got the redundancy with the symbol of the third eye, and you've got the serpent wrapped around her head. The same iconography once again. And it's so powerful in the Hindu tradition that even now, it's common practice to wear a symbol of the third eye on your forehead if you're a woman, and they all have these various bindis, as they're called, that they can order and wear. This is, uh, as we go more into uh, more recent gods, the god of drunkenness and revelry, <laughs> Bacchus. Uh, you can see he has the goat-shaped ears here, the kind of demonic almost looking, uh, and he also has the cloven feet. But then look at this. What's that? There it is again, huh? There's that pine cone. So once again, um, 
Why do you think alcohol, hard liquor, is called spirits? Think about that for a minute. Because it opens the door to these influences. And the ancient people knew that. That's why they were called spirits. Um, you've ever seen people who get like completely possessed when they're drunk and they just seem different and they seem a lot more negative? Well, negative entities in some cases seem to be able to grab hold through the pineal gland. And so they knew about all this. They knew that drunkenness and revelry opened up the pineal. That's why he's got it on the top of his staff. Dionysus, who is the, uh, the, the usher through the underworld, the usher through death and rebirth, he's also got the pineal gland, the pine cone on his staff. So there's the same message yet again. And here's another image of Dionysus with a bigger pine cone. Well, let's not leave out Buddhism. Check that out, right? Same exact thing once again, the hair. That's the, another symbol of the pineal gland. And even the fact that it looks like a pine cone with these little, the way that they braided their hair. I mean, all this was done deliberately to honor the pine cone. So then there's a quote from the Bible, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. That's Matthew 6.22. Well, that's pretty weird, huh? Guess how the mainstream Bible scholars interpret this passage I told you yesterday for those who were here. They say, well, you just have to be single-mindedly focused on God the Father as your salvation. That's why it's one eye. You just want to kind of look at him. Uh-uh. This is a single eye and it makes your whole body full of light. Well, the Bible says God is light, so this is what's going on. It's your, your hyperdimensional gateway. The third eye. The third eye, yeah. But surely we say, you know, even though maybe a Bible passage could be interpreted a certain way, it might not mean anything, probably doesn't mean anything. Surely the Vatican wouldn't follow something like this. That'd be silly. There's never any, any public acknowledgement of it, or do they? Well, check this out. This is the Vatican Square. And this is a uh, gigantic statue of a pine cone. It's the largest statue in the Vatican anywhere outside, except for this little ball over here, which we're going to look at closer in just a second. Notice the peacocks, which have a very kind of Egyptian feeling to them, like the ibis, right? The Egyptian ibis It's a very similar type of bird. And what's this all about? What's that look like to you? Aha, that's an open sarcophagus, just like in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. What does the open sarcophagus symbolize in the Great Pyramid? No more death. The transition into spiritual life. Okay? So, this all has to do with, I'm going to start walking a little bit. Um, this all has to do with the knowledge of the higher forces, the sacred geometry. All this stuff focuses on the pineal gland, the pine cone. Um, now, what do, they, what do they call this actual part of the Vatican? They call it the Court of the Pine Cone. Okay? How weird is that? <laughs> but I want to take a look at that little ball, so let's go in closer on it. There it is. That's huge. That's huge. And what's all this? This is like Greek columns, and then you, you get your saints on the top of the columns here. And here you have, I, I guess that's called the Basilica over there. Um, but you've got this gigantic ball, much bigger than anything else, and it's mirror polished. Well, that again is a symbol of, of divinity and the creator. Okay? Uh, well, there's the pine cone and here's a guy. Look at that. I mean, a, a man is not even tall enough to reach the bottom of the pedestal of this pine cone. What the heck is the point? If, if everything that I'm telling you is bullshit and you go home and are like, oh my God, this guy has been smoking some really weird stuff. Okay. It, Fine. If you want to believe that, that's fine, but answer me this. What the hell is that? And why is it there? And why do they care? And why is it in every single ancient culture in the world? It says the same exact thing, and it looks just like a gland. Any of them could have chopped open a head and found this gland in your brain. And they did. Well, this is what's at the bottom of that statue, okay? That's Egyptian cuneiform down there. And the lion, like the sphinx. This is the Vatican. Is anybody getting a does not compute on this? You got the ibises around the top of the thing. Okay. You got this weird mirror ball on the outside of the courtyard. You got this open sarcophagus, like in the Great Pyramid. Do you think maybe that they have a little bit more of an affinity with Egypt than we've been giving them credit for? Do you think that maybe the ancient Templars who designed the cathedrals 
used the same sacred geometry in the Great Pyramid in order to make those cathedrals so that they would function as consciousness resonators and amplifiers using the domed ceiling, using the stained glass windows that have sacred geometry mandalas in them, and using the Gregorian chant, which has the tones of sacred music that then activate your consciousness. This is what's going on. That's the other side. You can see, once again, the same thing. You have this, uh, this lion who's there. Well, okay, I guess if we put a cross on the top, it doesn't really count as an obelisk anymore. You know, we can kind of glide on that one. Doesn't work for me. This is very much something out of Egypt. And here's the smoking gun. The actual pontiff himself carries a staff that has a pine cone in the staff. Now, you cannot tell me that all this is an accident, especially when you understand that the esoteric symbolism of the staff First of all, you notice it looks like a tree, and that's the central axis of the world tree, right? I don't have a slide for it here, but the world tree is what the ancient people saw when they looked at those nested spheres. You remember the, the mushroom-looking thing that I showed you before? If you go out into the solar system out of body, you see these, these they look like umbrellas. And so you see a trunk in the middle, and then it moves out like this into this into what's that sphere that we're showing you. So that's what they used to think of as a tree. So this symbolizes the world tree. What's the joining point between the world tree of spirit and the physical pontiff, who is the actualized embodiment of spirit? It's the pine cone. So this is showing how the pineal gland, once it's fully awakened, allows you access to the world tree, which is the repository of all spiritual wisdom and knowledge. So the pineal gland has been explained through conventional methods, conventional means, to some degree, uh, they have figured out what it does by looking at how when light strikes your retina, there's a little nerve system here called the preganglion sympathetic neurons, and they move through, and the light transitions itself into your pineal gland. Okay, When the light goes off, it signals electromagnetically to the pineal gland that it's time to go to sleep, which then secretes melatonin into your cerebrospinal fluid, which activates the whole brain's sleep mechanism, the whole nervous system, okay? So the pineal gland is very much associated with going to sleep. Well, that makes sense because when you go into a mystical state of consciousness, typically you have to go into a very meditative, very zoned out, very relaxed Zen type of consciousness. That's not an accident. So again, if therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. So when you cut off the light on the outside, the light opens up on the inside. That's the melatonin mechanism. Well, the pineal gland is activated when light goes out. Jesus also said the people who sat, sat in darkness saw a great light, Matthew 14, Matthew 4.16. Again, the idea that it's only when, you, when the light goes out and you can activate your pineal gland that you have the full access to this knowledge. So the pineal gland also secretes another chemical. This is more recent research called dimethyltryptamine, or DMT. Uh, it's becoming increasingly popular in the New Age circuit now that people are taking these South American potions like Yopo and Ayahuasca, which is the one you're probably more familiar with. Uh, the actual dictionary definition of what DMT does is that it includes profound time dilation, Time travel, this is when you're accessing the time field, right? Time is three-dimensional. It's no longer linear. You can shift time. Journeys to paranormal realms, that's like those fairy circles, the gnome circles, right? And encounters with spiritual beings or other mystical transdimensional modalities. All right, so there's the, the shape of it once again. Now, what's the big secret? The interior is filled with water. How does that seem like a big secret? Who cares? Why would it matter that there's water inside the pineal gland? Well, those of you who were here yesterday know the answer. Um, the interior of the pineal gland, the water flips in and out through time space. We'll get to that in a second. The problem that most people are having is that the water calcifies as you age. In fact, that's how they're able to figure out if your brain has a tumor when you're getting an MRI. Most people have this chunk of calcium in the center of their brain which looks white on the MRI or on an X-ray. And if that little guy is off to one side, why is that? Think about it. Because what? The tumor is pushing on the brain, and it knocks it off of alignment. So our pineal gland is actually supposed to be used for transdimensional access, but instead what's happening is 
that we're calcifying it by our diet, by the use of fluoride in our toothpaste, fluoride in our water, by the drinking too much soda, carbonated beverages, uh, too much uh, refined fats, refined sugars, refined flours, white flour. It's, anything in moderation is okay. I'm not saying you got to go on a totally Spartan crazy diet. But this calcification is also what the Bible calls the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is on the forehead, right? Does everybody remember that from the Bible? And what was it supposed to mean? It's supposed to mean that you're captured in the grip of materialism. Well, that means that you don't have your spiritual access open. That's the symbolism. The symbolism is when you look at the chakras, you actually see a dark spot up here. So that's where that comes from. Now, this is what gets, this is where it starts getting very, very strange, okay? If you haven't already been blown away, this is gonna where, this is where it should start to change your consciousness. The interior of the pineal gland all along the inside has rods and cones just like the retina on your eye. Do you think that maybe when they called it a third eye, that they knew what they were talking about? Do you think that an eye must have a cornea and a lens? and all this vitreous fluid in it like we have, the fluid is there. But you just got the retina. So there's something that appears to be happening inside. It's like there's a little television in here. And you can actually get audio out of it, and you can get video out of it, and that video feed is being picked up by the rods and cones, and that's your imagination. That's the mind's eye. You actually have a retina. Have you noticed that when you visualize something strongly enough, that you really do see it. You can close your eyes, but you're still seeing things. This is where it's coming from. Now, not, some of it obviously can happen in the mind. I'm not saying that everything that you think is, is showing up inside this little gland here. But what I am saying is that a lot of it, a lot of your contact with the other side, when you're traveling through time or when you're having a dream, the interface between your dreaming body, the silver cord, as it's called. The silver cord is anchored right here. That's where it comes from. That's why when people have an out-of-body experience, they hear a loud cracking noise, and then they fly out of body. The crack comes from right in here. So, the answer to why this works is that there is an electromagnetic shield that is created when the light goes out. It may be stimulated by the release of the DMT, but these two little arteries here, they don't look like much, but it's a known fact that the pineal gland has more blood flow per cubic volume than any other gland in the body. This gland has the most high amount of concentration of energy from your body of anything else. And that's because it's our gateway. So if you can start to imagine the idea that there's this complex electromagnetic shield that starts forming like this, and you see all these weird rotations happening around it, and they're all going in these different directions, what that actually, and it becomes so fast, it's like, you know, if you, if you move it fast enough, which I'm not really capable of doing, it would just start to be all red. You get a, a perfectly formulated shield around the gland. When you do that, you have now shielded off all of the electromagnetic, gravitational, and otherwise, well, not gravitational, but all the electromagnetic, the radio waves, uh, all the energy that gives us a reference in space-time. That opens up the door to time space, just like when you shoot that little carbon 60 molecule, the little buckyball, at the slit, and it pops inside out, and it turns into a wave as it goes through. Well, there are little molecules inside this water called microclusters, and those molecules can flip over, and that's the gateway that allows you to see into time space. So darkness activates electromagnetic activity. It feels like a pressure, a buzz, or a tone or acceleration inside your head. Has anybody here not had that experience? Okay, no hands have gone up. When you feel, you'll hear sometimes it's almost like there's a gong or you feel like a pressure in your head. That's, now, now some people just call that kundalini activation, but what's actually happening is that sometimes spontaneously, even during the day, your pineal gland just kicks up. It's like a car engine, whoo, and it suddenly gets going, and you feel this sort of explosive energy shooting up into your head. This is actually this mechanism, this machinery of electromagnetic charge zooming around, doing all these different things to shield off the water inside to give you access. So if that ever happens, if you get that tone in your ears, just try to tune into the meditative state 
and get really clear and figure out what's the, what's the message of that moment. A lot of times it'll be that whatever happened right before you get the tone is something really important for your spiritual evolution. Could so you want. Also seem like a excruciating headache? It can. Headaches can happen, but that's when there's a blockage. That's when there's something in yourself that's not allowing this to fully open. And that, at that level, deals with not being able to see yourself as a sacred being, seeing yourself as unholy, seeing yourself as impure. So it really does boil down to self-acceptance. When you're fully aware and self-accepting, you can fully open your pineal gland. That requires a great deal of work, which is what we're getting into later in this talk. So the water becomes your conduit to time space, the parallel reality, and then your interior retina in your third eye, because you actually do have three, records the visual images. That's what all the ancient cultures painted the bindi on their forehead for. DMT seems to accelerate the activity. LSD and other psychedelics force the pineal to release DMT. It's potentially dangerous, so I'm not recommending you go out and start tripping because your pineal can get stuck on even when you're awake. And that's the actual nature of schizophrenia, delusions, and waking hallucinations. There have been multiple studies that have been done proving that shamanic visionary experiences and schizophrenic hallucinatory experiences are almost identical. What the ancient shamans have happened to them is just about the same as what happens to schizos. It's just that the schizo is cracked, that the, the walnut is cracked, as I call it, or the acorn, or the pine cone, right? Um, if you have some of that electrical activity that doesn't know when to shut off, which could be also the melatonin, right? When the melatonin kicks out, it's telling you to go to sleep. That's what starts to fire up this engine. It's only when the DMT kicks out a little bit that the engine goes into full steam. But that's usually only after you fall asleep. But as you start to fall asleep, the melatonin starts to rev up the engine. Well, a schizophrenic doesn't get enough sleep. That's one of the things that every study has shown about schizophrenia. They are insomniacs. So if you do that enough, then melatonin more and more will start to uh, be synthesized while you're awake, and it starts to open your gateway, and you start getting these hallucinations. So DMT is what's cracking that protection of keeping it electromagnetically dormant while you're awake. So it does very much look like the pineal gland is a natural hypergate. Now, here's another interesting thing. Uh, a colleague of mine discovered that the eardrum inside the ear is tilted on a weird angle. That's not straight up and down like you'd think it would be or that you normally would imagine. It's tilted, and it actually tilts forward like this. So the eardrums look like this inside your head. Okay? What he found was that he could build microphones that had this orientation like where they are in your head, and he gets a three-dimensional recording. So if I were to take one of these mics and put it here in the room, and then somebody ran over through the back screaming. And then we take his speakers, because he built holographic speakers, and you pop the speakers right there in the same exact room, and you press play on the tape recording. You're going to hear that person running behind the room as if they were there. You get a holographic sound. Now, it makes sense, right? If light can be holographic, light is a vibration, why couldn't you do exactly the same thing with sound? This is how it's done. It's done by reverse engineering the way your ears already work because the human ear has a better three-dimensional tracking system than any other creature. The only creature that even comes close is the owl, which obviously for the hunting purposes. So we have a very unique hyperdimensional mechanism, and he actually also found that, the, that the, these uh, lobes of the, of the inner ear here are corresponding in the geometric angles to the uh, Great Pyramid, the angles and slope of the Great Pyramid. So this is what happens. They're coplanar with a tetrahedron inside your head, the point of which comes out through the third eye center. And, of course, the third eye is at the geometric center of this. So when you're going into the pineal gland, when you're falling asleep, you're going to lie down. You're going to tilt your head like this. Which way is the, is the tetrahedron pointing now? Which way is the triangle going to be? Like this, right? And your eye is in the center. So doesn't that look a lot like this? So this is the secret, okay? There, there is a secret that has been kept right in front of our eyes. Nobody understands it. And again, as I said yesterday, I'm actually releasing this information for the first time. No one has ever made this public before. This is from deep in the black ops stuff, and I only was able to put the whole thing together from seven different witness testimonies that all correlated independently of each other. 
That's how I found out that it's from the pineal gland. I'm not sure that they would want anybody to know this. So I am taking a risk at revealing this, but that's why I did it publicly first. Because this is what's happening. This is why this matters, okay? Could we reverse engineer the pineal gland? We have a basic system here. We have water that flips inside out. This allows you to see over into this other realm that we already know exists because we can prove in quantum physics that a particle turns into a wave and the wave is spaced out in time. Or has it already been done? Has it already been done? In fact, we have to ask ourselves, what are the needs? We need a barrel-shaped or pine cone-shaped container holding water, and it would have to be a special water. Uh, then you have to have an electromagnetic shielding capability. Like I was saying, you've got to have this, this system that can do all this kind of stuff inside in order to shield it off from space-time. You have to be able to fine-tune the fields because, as it turns out, how these little vibrations run has everything to do with where it goes. It's like Google Earth. Everybody here use Google Earth? You ever seen it? You can click on something and you zoom in on it. Well, that's what the fine-tuning of these fields does for you. It actually is like coordinates, latitude, longitude, and time. Uh, then you need some kind of method to pick up the visual images. Now, normally in the pineal gland, you do it with the retinal tissue, but you don't have a retina when you're dealing with a machine, so what do you do? Well, what does a television use? It uses a cathode ray, right? It's a little thing that shoots onto this sur surface, and the electrons strike the surface, and they glow. Well, an ionized gas is going to glow if you strike it with this energy, so why not squirt an ionized gas in the middle, and then that might pick up the visual images? Well, this is what it looks like. This is real. This is, yesterday and today is the very first public unveiling in a public presentation of Project Looking Glass. A human being is about this tall. This is built in underground bases. It is colossal in size. And what happens is when you fire this thing up, these rings start going in all different directions. It shields off the barrel of water inside, which is just like your pineal gland. The water inside flips over into time space which then captures argon gas, captures visual images, and this is what it looks like. It becomes huge, glowing, all the way out to these posts, which are used as stabilizers for the energy field. Now, it doesn't start out with an image of the Earth. That's just there as a placeholder, although you could see the whole Earth like that if you wanted to. That's not usually what happens. Well, contact, right? We have been given the technology right in front of our faces in the movies, they just don't tell you what it's for. In what? 13 Ghosts? Well, thank you. I'll have to check that one out. Doesn't sound like a movie I'd want to see, but if it's for that... Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> so, contact, just to recap from yesterday, uh, blueprints come in from the Vegans, from Vega. They figure out that it's only when you fold up these patterns into a cube which forms what there in the center, the triangle with the eye in the middle as it folds up, cube geometry. That's when you can decode the plans to build this, these rings, which becomes this machine. And there's your little helicopter. So there's another shot of it. They got computer animations of how it's going to work with the different rings moving. This actually looks like the fisheye lens distortion effect that happens around the looking glass when you power it on. There's a gantry crane up at the top. And the little guy is dropped down and goes inside. That's like your barrel inside the, the uh, mechanism there. And this is where all the action happens. This is where the stargate opens, the wormhole, into the higher realms. In this frame, we're seeing how the whole thing collapsed and fell apart. So, of course, you want to take a ride. You know, the new, uh, <laughs> the new formation of, of the one after the old one breaks. And here we're seeing the new one. Once again, you get a very clear view, and there's your little eye with the rays coming off it, just like the all-seeing eye on the dollar. Not surprising. Here she is. It's even larger than the real one, standing on this, uh, on this ladder, looking down inside. This is the chamber and the chair inside, which we'll see is very important. And here's your geometry. Look at that. Did anybody notice that when you were watching the movie? Because it goes by pretty fast. That's that same geometry that's in the background radiation of the whole universe with the sphere in the center. They fire it up. Guess what happens? Big, bright luminosity, just like the real thing, the real thing that they're actually using and have been using since the 40s at least. 
and here's what it looked like from the control room. It gets brighter and brighter, and then she starts having the floor disappear. She gets dropped down inside, and then, of course, she goes through this wild uh, wormhole ride, and there's an ascension experience at the end of the dream, because it is like a big dream, because she's in the dream plane. Now, last Mimsy, again, you got the same principle. The children find this, these little objects. She finds this, uh, this toy uh, rabbit, and he finds this little uh, thing that helps him speak to the spiders. It all comes out of this, it, this cube that they find. Well, guess what's going on here? Same thing. It, it creates, a, at the end of the movie, it has created a wormhole into the higher realms, which allows them to send DNA into the future. Uh, now, this movie is like an infomercial for everything that my colleague, Dr. Dan Burrish, has been saying he dealt with in Majestic 12, dealing with extraterrestrials from our own human future, future human lineage extraterrestrials, as he called them. That apparently, in, in his system, they have gone to the future, they have uh, survived, but they had a small gene pool as a result of the cataclysmic activity in 2012, and I'll get into why I don't believe this is what's going on. And then they needed our DNA, and they're trying to come back in time to get our DNA to fix their genetic problem. So this whole movie is just a big infomercial for all the stuff that Burrish has been saying right down the letter. And there was a lot of development on the script. It is actually a great movie. I do recommend it. Now, here's the thing. This is actually precisely what was found, except for the sphere, but the shape, and then even the little filigree on the outside, the little one-centimeter raised filigree, this is what's called the cube. It was found in the Roswell crash. And this is what it looks like when the tides open. Just, do you ever see the movie Hellraiser? I don't know if you'd want to. But they have a little puzzle, a little box that they flip, and then it pops open, just like this. And what happens when it pops open? Where do you end up going? You go into this parallel reality that's like hell, right? So that's all based on real knowledge, because some of the spiritual planes you can go to are pretty nasty places. So when it opens up, you get these brilliant, vibrant colors inside and this grid pattern. It's called the yellow disk because the little yellow disk forms right here when it starts. And then you get a full color image, unlike the other, uh, the, the other one where it's argon gas and it's all yellowy. It get, you get a, a perfect color image on the, on the real thing. And, of course, there's a treaty that they have with the ETs that pr forbids them from giving you the writing that's on those panels. We can't do anything about that. Again, you're seeing the same redundant geometric metaphors here, the sphere with the geometry. So all of this stuff, all of this usage of the looking glass technology has created some very, very interesting things. They have used this, for example, to cheat on presidential elections. Think about it. If you actually did have a technology that could allow you to look into the future and you're running for office, what are you going to want to do? You're going to want to go look at the newspaper headlines and the television and figure out what swing states you lost. So then you're back in time, and you can program your Diebold voting machines to tip the vote just enough that it's exactly 50-50, which is what happened in 2000 with George W. versus Gore, and it's what happened again in 2004 with George W. versus John Kerry. Okay? The problem is that as a result of the fear that they have that in 2012 that you're going to get an Earth axis shift, which is caused by an inappropriate amount of energy moving through the looking glass devices. They have, as of December 2006, completely deactivated and deconstructed all looking glass technologies on the Earth. The Iraq war had, to a large degree, the mission of capturing a looking glass technology that was dug up in Sumer, which was originally in the possession of Gaddafi in Libya, which is why they attacked Libya. Gaddafi got rid of it and gave it to Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein was using this technology, viewing the future. The U.S. government went in after him because they felt that the fate of the world was at stake because if they did not capture this technology and get it back and deconstruct it, that the Earth would have a pole shift. So this is what they say, and it's a great story. It'll make a great movie, which I'm sure is being written. <laughs> Expand, we're going to get into the pole shift and why I don't think that that's what's going on at all.
don't have a negative doom and gloom disaster view of our future. It's very important that you hear that, even though I know some of this stuff might be a little freaky looking. So the D of the CTP is what they call it in code parlance, because nobody's going to know what that means. But when you actually decipher these letters, it means the doctrine of the convergent timeline paradox. Uh, here's the problem. You look through time with this device, and when you hit 2012, everything goes perfectly white. As you get closer and closer to 2012, starting in around 1980, a very strange thing has been happening when they use the looking glass. There is an interlacing of images. So right now, imagine that if I had this slide on half the time, and then the other half of the time, there was an image of like a face. And if I interlace them slowly, then maybe every second it goes from here to the face to here to the face. Then as it speeds up, it gets faster and faster to the point that if it were complex images, you couldn't make out one from the other because they're flip-flopping so fast. Okay, That's called interlacing, and the frequency of the interlacing gets higher and higher as you go towards 2012. So any time that they try to look at, like, or they used to try to look because they're not using them anymore, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, bam. It's so interlaced that they have a whole server farm of computers just to deconstruct the two images and be able to see what they're looking at in the future. So again, this is what they're using. This is one of the main ones they're using, the Orion Cube, as they call it, or the Cube. And also, it's being used with looking glass. But what's going on with 2012? Well, here's another very interesting thing. Uh, Dan Burrish who I've had multiple discussions with privately, uh, and we're actually going to have an event that we're speaking at together at Caltech, which is later in March. Um, and I'm going to have that on my website if you're interested. It's going to be local. My website is divinecosmos.com. Uh, and we're going to talk about all this stuff there to some degree, but it's mostly going to be on his research with uh, biology, which we'll get into later. But um, anyway, we have multiple parallel futures that we can choose. And what he found was there was a treaty that they were trying to do with the extraterrestrials that was codenamed Tau-9. And in the Tau-9 treaty, they had a line item in the treaty that was intended to share his biology technology with the ETs. And that technology was able to reproduce the original seed of all life on Earth, which the, which the ETs wanted to use to be able to heal their own DNA because they believe that they're human lineage. So what he found out was that these other beings apparently had contacted him and said, Do, you cannot tamper with the tree of life. You can look at it, you can admire it, but you can't mess with it. The tree of life is the actual source code of our DNA. So what was happening was they were looking into the future, and he took the, the negative visual that he got from the alien, from, the, from the, uh, the ascended being that came to him and warned him about the tree of life. He held that image in his mind of what would happen to the earth in 2012 if this were allowed to happen. And the image inside the looking glass immediately shifted to the apocalyptic vision. So he was able to prove by doing this that you can determine the outcome of what this thing shows you by your conscious focus. So this is, 2012 literally does represent create your own reality time. It has everything to do with what do you expect is going to happen. This is where thoughts becoming reality really takes on a whole new meaning in a way that you've never heard of before. Now again, I also had a contact with a man named Daniel. You can hear about the story on the free three and a half hour Project Camelot video that's on my website. You can go look it up. I met this guy in New York. I was stranded at the airport because of the snow. I, I ended up going to a Denny's. It was the only place that was open. I had brought the Montauk book with me for some reason, even though I thought it was all just a bunch of crap. And this dude walks by in like biker gear and a big burly beard. Big, big guy. So you like that stuff, huh? You like that Montauk. I said, oh my gosh, this is all a bunch of crap. He says, you know, I used to work for Preston Nichols. What? Preston Nichols is one of the authors of the book. 
And I, I just started laughing. I said, I said, look, there's no way that there's no way that you worked at Montauk because Montauk is a joke. It's it's fake. Well, he kept on talking, and the next thing you know, he sat down, and we stayed up all night, and I had like scribbles all over the place maps, and <laughs> I mean, this guy. And it's a shame that he doesn't want to go public because I'll tell you, he's got an amazing amount of information. And I didn't go into it very much yesterday. Some people asked me to go into it a little bit more, so I will do that. You have to understand that there is a basic, there is a basic New World Order and Illuminati, if you will, which is primarily run by the Rothschild family. The Rothschild means Red Shield, which is uh, all kinds of esoteric symbolism we could go into, which I don't have the time for. The Rothschilds financed Stalin and the takeover of Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. They have financed the French Revolution. They financed World War II. They financed Hitler, and they were financing the U.S. So they, they believe in order out of chaos. You fund both sides of a war, and whichever side wins, you got their vote because you're their paymaster. You've given them their money. You control their financial supply, which means you can control the government. Okay? And you profit no matter what. Right. And also what happens is that the war stimulates the economy so you get much more infrastructure and much more buildings coming out of it. That's why, for example, Ford Motor Company was building tank plants in Germany, which is why Hitler's Wehrmacht had the tanks. It was from Ford. When American bombers bombed Ford's tank plants in Germany, Ford personally repaid Hitler so he could rebuild the tank plants faster. Boeing actually was shipping, this has been documented, has, was shipping passenger airliners to South America, which were then sent to Africa, where they ripped the seats out and turned them into Hitler's bomber fleet. That was Boeing. These are American corporations. The whole idea of these big wars is a joke. It's a setup. It's a game that's played to play off the opposites against each other in the hopes of synthesizing a new world order where we all kind of synthesize. That's why Democrat and Republican is a joke. Okay? They want certain aspects of the conservative Republican Party. They want, for example, the, the uh, cultish religious aspect, but it's not Christianity. That's why the liberal side is all about being open and being free and, and not having any of these traditional shackles on you. Because what they ultimately want is a racist society. They're very racist. And they're interested in a new world order which is run by a Luciferian philosophy. Now, this is very disturbing sounding stuff. But they actually believe that since they have the secret tradition that goes back to Atlantis, and that they've been persecuted for thousands and thousands of years by various people. Nobody persecuted them as badly as the Roman government through the Catholic Christian Church. They were tortured, they were killed, so they came to the natural conclusion, you can understand anybody would have done this under the circumstances. What do you think they would choose? They would say, okay, whatever God these guys think is God, that's not the right one, because he's, he's stringing us out on the rack, he's torturing us, he's killing us. Therefore, whoever the Christian church says is the bad guy is the good guy. Okay, wait a minute. Lucifer is the brightest light, the brightest angel in heaven, right? And he's the one that got tossed out of heaven. Well, maybe he got tossed out of heaven because he was too cool, right? Because, because everybody else in there was a bunch of corrupt shysters. Well, this is actually what the most powerful people in the world think. And they are a fundamentalist religion just like any of the others. They still believe this weird stuff. They follow these teachings. They actually buy into this. Okay, So that's why it's weird because you see these political parties that are siding with religious fundamentalist Christianity, and they actually do have a fundamentalist religion, but it's the mirror opposite. So their energy vibrates with each other, and that's why they work together so well. Don't forget, of course, that Hitler was also running on a Christian platform. And who was Hitler's main ally in World War II in Europe? Italy. Italy is the Vatican. The Pope and all that stuff was supporting Nazi Germany, okay? Because it was in the Vatican, which was in Italy, which was Mussolini. So, the reason why I'm telling you all this is not for you to have a fatalistic sense of doom. It's to also enlighten you to the fact that this is going on, that it's real, 
and that the Nazis were very, very proactive in rebuilding all of the ancient secrets that had been lost because for the first time they had a world power government that could go out and militarily by force invade places that were being kept under lock and key with heavy guard and go in and steal the artifacts and the technologies that would allow them to rebuild their so-called master race and all this stuff that they're so into. Okay? What's that? Raiders of the Lost Ark. Exactly. So, what do you think happens when a UFO crashes in, in World War II and the people who financed Nazi Germany, once it collapsed, they're looking for as much technology, as much goodies as they can get their hands on. So what do you think they're going to do when these UFOs crash? They're going to want to rip out everything from those UFOs imaginable and reverse engineer it and make it into something they can use. So what's the first thing that they go for? They take out the chair. Because these UFOs, you're sitting there in the chair and you say you want to go somewhere, you meditate on it, and a vortex opens up in front of the ship and you fly through it and you pop through a wormhole and you end up somewhere else. Okay? So that's what the chair does. The chair is the interface with your consciousness. So when you understand that your consciousness is interfacing through the chair, that helps you get to a point in yourself where you can see that the chair is a psychic amplifier. That's what it does. The chair's function is that it takes your natural, innate psychic function and makes it vastly more powerful. Oh, the Philadelphia experiment uh, was uh, the result of the testing of high energy arc welding on the creation of very large battleships by the U.S. Navy in World War II uh, surrounding Norfolk Naval Air Force Base, which I used to be right near in Virginia Beach. What they found was that when you got this, uh, this high energy, th this was the highest arc welding ever done, like a big bolt of lightning. And it pinched time space into space time. So you get this black hole in the room. And then actually they were having tools disappear. So the tools never came back and they realized there's something here we can use and they actually designed it into something that they put on the ship in the hopes that the ship would be able to be invisible like the tools became invisible. What they didn't realize is that they were going to jump from one place to another and it had a devastating effect on the crew. Anyway, uh, I don't want to spend all of our time just going through this old material, so we're going to get back to the chair, we're going to get back to the point that they could actually create a wormhole with the chair, with the psychics exercising their consciousness in the chair. They had help from, apparently, ETs from Sirius in designing the chair. And the chair allowed them to send people through time. There were multiple wavelengths that the chair cranked out on graph paper. Okay. Some of those wavelengths were corresponding to a natural 20-year harmonic in the Earth's vibration. And that 20-year harmonic, as it turns out, if people were moving through time, which is one of the things they found they could do, is send people through time, this wave would tell you exactly where you were in time, depending on where up and down it was. So what they found that was so bizarre was that at December 21st, 2012, they could calculate it down to the day, that's how precise this was, that for some reason all the graphs, all the waves would go into a complete flat line. They no longer moved up and down like before. They went flat for like seven or eight seconds. So then they're asking the guys that went through these stargates and were traveling into the future, what happened to you? Every single time that somebody tried to hit 2012, they said the same thing. There was this thing they called the bump. It actually hits you like a bump. You actually feel like you've slammed into something. And as soon as it slams into you, you have the most incredible religious experience you can imagine. Cosmic consciousness. Your consciousness just blasts into this wonderful place where you have awareness of no space, no time. All knowledge is available to you. Ecstatic God consciousness. You could be the galaxy. You could be a subatomic particle. You can go everywhere, do everything, and there is no sense of it ever ending. So when it finally stops, you just can't even believe that you're back to who you were before. Like what happened to Jodie Foster. Exactly what happens to Jodie Foster in contact. So. Is that, is that the moment of no time then? That's the zero time, yeah. And Daniel doesn't agree with me on this, but I believe that 2012 is our zero time <laughs> reference. By the way, 
Daniel did say that the stargates are real, that there is one main stargate per planet, that they dug them up from ancient Atlantean technology. They actually buried it under the ice in Antarctica because they were concerned that something would come through that could damage human life. So that is real. Stargate SG-1, all those television shows of which there's 10 seasons, the first and second year of Stargate SG-1 are remarkably loaded with real stuff. And there's even an episode of Stargate called Wormhole Extreme, and you remember that one? Where they're making a fake television show about a real Stargate program. It's like this inside tongue-in-cheek joke. And everybody watching the show kind of knows, okay, they're telling us something here. There's something real behind all this stuff. Well, it's true. Why do they do that? Okay, that's a very good point. Um, the reason why they do that is that you hide the truth out in the open so that if I go, go into this lecture and I'm telling you all this stuff, you can just say, oh, well, he's just, he's just into Stargate. You know, he's just watching television shows. But if, in fact, this was really cool. One time um, I was sitting down with Daniel one day, and we're talking about the looking glass, and this has a little uh, orb that appears when you're looking at a particular place, and it's a ball of light. So they gave it this really weird name. They call it an outer band individuated teletracer. Okay? Outer band individuated teletracer. And they shortened it to the word obit. Outer band individuated teletracer, an obit, right? So then we're thinking, all right, this is what they always do, right? They hide this shit out in the open. Let's go Google outer band individuated teletracer and see if there's anything there. I couldn't believe it when we went on Google after he just told me this. He had no idea either. And boom, Outer Limits. There's an episode of The Outer Limits called Outer Band Individuated Teletracer. Wow. And it's all about this stuff. There was a show. He, he was actually really interested in me, too, because I seem to have some sort of psychic connection to, this, to these things. He says, he says to me one day, what do you think a TVG is? I said, time vector generator. How did you know that? You're right. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I did not go to Montauk. I've never sat in the chair. Somebody asked me that. Did you, were you in the chair? No, no, no. I was just very, very fortunate by some kind of crazy synchronicity to meet this guy. I wish he would go forward, but he doesn't want to. He did tell me, by the way, that they have found life on other planets. He said that the moon Io around Jupiter has little creatures crawling in the, in the rocks. He said that Mars once had a civilization, that they've actually had astronauts on Mars, that they have a photograph that he saw of these astronauts waving with a big pyramid next to them. They actually have underground bases on Mars. There's a technology we've learned about from other witnesses now called a jump room, where you walk into the room, it's like an elevator, the doors close, <laughs> you suddenly feel really sick to your stomach, the doors open, and boom, you're on Mars, just like that. No time has elapsed. So these technologies already exist. And I would certainly like to have one. It would be a lot easier than taking an airplane flight. You can get over the stomach thing, I guess. So, you know, again, all, all gate travel is much better than using a, using a ship. It's a much pref preferable method um, than, than traveling by a spaceship uh, because you go a lot faster and you go a lot farther. And you can reverse engineer it by taking the seat out of the ship, which is what they're doing here. So, have these seats ever showed up in film so that they can hide it out in the open? <laughs> well, check this out. There's your seat. Now, this one doesn't actually have any consciousness interface, but some of the other ones do. Total recall. Jump rooms to Mars, civilization on Mars, underground city, pyramid at the end. And once again, you have a chair that has a strong effect on your consciousness. In Stargate SG-1, they have the chair of the ancients, and O'Neill sits in it, and it activates and, and amplifies his consciousness, which allows him to def defeat the evil fleet of the Gua'uld by shooting balls of light at them. Minority report. Here you have people sitting in chairs, floating in water, and they are psychic, and it is amplifying their psychic ability, which Tom Cruise is then able to manipulate on a screen one of the things that Daniel told me is that out of all the waves that this chair cranks out from the ships, that it also includes visual images from your pineal gland. And they can space them out and look at them just like in the movie. 
So this may have been designed to set the precedent so that someday they could actually create a department of pre-crime. Now what also is very interesting is that the witness testimony we have of people going through these wormholes shows us that it looks like little light bulbs lined along the sides as you go inside. So that right there is not an accident. We've already got free crime in Britain. Really? Jim Mars has been talking about it. Oh, how about that? Jim Mars has been talking about pre-crime in Britain, he said. Okay, X-Men is another one. You remember Cerebro, where he wheels up to this thing? This is actually the antenna at Montauk, except that it's a it's an octahedron, two Egyptian pyramids base to base. But the same basic idea. There's a chair in there. You put this little helmet on. This is where you sit. And then it amplifies your psychic ability. That's what allows him to be able to find the missing mutants when they go missing. It's what allows them... You remember that one scene in, uh, in, in X-Men where... Um, one of the whole movies, actually, the plot is that there's an e that there's an evil force that's going to harness his consciousness to get him to run the chair and basically kill everybody who's a mutant on the planet with the psychic amplification. So this is all based on this real technology. Uh, now here's what was strange: this 20-year loop has a bad side effect. When the Philadelphia experiment happened 20 years ago. There was an enormous amount of energy released. That energy reflected through the time domain. It got stuck in the time domain. An enormous, almost a nuclear release of energy was caused in the Philadelphia experiment or the Rainbow Project in 1943. There's a 20-year harmonic, and during certain favorable points in the harmonic, if you have a huge energy release, you're going to get another one down here, and you have a conduit or a gateway between those two areas. Okay? This is bad. We don't like this. This is called a rift. It's very dangerous. It's very serious. 1943 created a rift 40 years later with 1983, I guess somewhere around here. And um, 1983 was when a, a creature got through August 13th, 1983, and trashed the entire base and destroyed the Montauk base, destroyed the chair. It just so happens that Daniel called in sick and wasn't at work that day. So he didn't get mind wiped, so they didn't erase the memories out of his mind. So he remembers everything that he learned and everything that happened when he was working on this base. Somebody has a question. I just heard it in my head. What kind of creature? Um, the creature was based on the movie Forbidden Planet, which was the monster from the id. The secret that, that Daniel knows, because he was in contact with the guy running the chair, Duncan Cameron, is that they were very pissed off at these Nazis. They did not like the Nazis. They didn't like what they were doing. They thought they had too much power. They thought the potential to misuse this technology was much too vast. And they said, we need to figure out how to stop this thing from going on. They created the monster with their own thought. The official view is that it's a rift and that some interdimensional monster came through. The reality is they took advantage of the 20-year harmonic, which they knew would have that energy, and they used it to create that monster to kill the program, and it worked. So that's the truth. What's that? They would be the, uh, what you would call in the Stargate SG-1, the Tok'ra, the inside people who are not going along with their bosses, but they're rebelling, the white hats, so to speak. So, yeah, hold on real quick. I'm moving back of everyone. So Daniel is the burly guy you met and knocked out for Dan Burrish. That's Daniel is the burly guy that I met. He named himself after Daniel in the Stargate series, Daniel Jackson. Is he okay? Are you sure he's okay? I mean, I'm sure that he's okay now. <laughs> well, um, he's, he's in seclusion. I haven't even seen him in two years. Um, he usually lives out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, he doesn't like a lot of uh, human contact because he's been psychically trained. He was measured as a P7. He had a special psychic gift called a conduit, which allowed him to feel other people's emotions and thoughts very, very strongly. And as a conduit, he was able to take, like in did everybody see the movie Powder? He could do just that. In fact, it's possible because they, he was the only person they ever found that could do that. It's possible that the movie Powder was written about him. I don't know that for a fact, but it's possible. He also has some really weird stories. He said that he was accosted by a gray extraterrestrial when he was in his uh, remote location, and he shot it with a shotgun. 
And he said that they found out in these programs that the, that the extraterrestrial physiology is, is like a vegetable and not like a body. So you can shoot them and they don't, they don't get hurt. This thing, and it just sort of kept walking. <laughs> Very weird, huh? So yeah, and that's what's so strange is that when I was in high school, I wrote a story about a guy who shoots an extraterrestrial with a shotgun. And we started to find all these weird correspondences. The first time I took LSD, and I have done acid, I did, you know, 20 some odd trips. I had a very strange experience. As I was coming down the stairs, I was peeking. I was like, what in the world is happening to me? I had this feeling that if I did not create the floor under my feet with my mind, that I would fall through the floor. And so I'm walking very carefully like this, tripping, just, oh, shit. It turns out that that's exactly what happened in the Rainbow Project Philadelphia experiment. It turns out that the people who could remember where they were before they went into this gray mist of zero time didn't get stuck in the hull of the ship. But the people who couldn't remember where the ship was and couldn't create the ship from memory, when they got through, they were stuck in the hull and died in many cases because you can't pull somebody out. So he said, you know, he has some weird ideas and, uh, you know, he thought that I was connected to the project somehow, like my soul is basically helping to relieve the karma of the planet uh, through this thing that happened. And I guess this is part of what I have to do is, is share this with you because obviously there's a reason why I met this guy. Um, and that's the funny thing, too, is you can tell that this is real because people ask me a question and I pop out with something new, something new, because I've had many, many hours of conversation with Daniel. No, I'm not gay. No, we're not homosexually involved. <laughs> Somebody wrote that on the Internet. It's like, pff, forget it. I haven't even seen him in two years. We were just friends, that's all. Okay? Get over it. And even if I was gay, which I'm not, what possible difference would that have to my message or to the value of the material that I'm sharing with you? Can I get an amen on that? Come on. I mean, really, let's just let go of these ridiculous prejudices because everybody has a right to be here. Every soul is precious beyond measure. I am not a racist. The DNA level shows us that we are so similar that you cannot actually tell what somebody's race is from a genetic test. It's only very, very weird special things that they have to go out of their way to find to look. But we're 99.9% .9 the same. It is. It's a smear tactic and it's being used to dumb us down and to get us fighting with each other rather than looking to the source of the problem. Okay, but that's what we're doing. By shedding light on it, we're helping to understand it. So, the reason why I'm going to go into rifts and holes in time is because it has to do with 2012 and it has to do with you breaking down the conditioning. Let me finish the sentence. Breaking down the conditioning that has kept you from seeing the greater reality that we live in. Question. Can you go back to the, the 20 years time cycle? Yep. Yeah. Okay, okay. He asked a good question, which is, okay, the apexes of the, of the wave and the, and the bottoms of the wave is a 20-year cycle, but especially from top to top, the 40-year cycle, from 43 to 83, you get this big conduit, you get this big rift that was created by the Philadelphia Experiment. Now, again, it could have been anywhere. It was the fact that the Philadelphia Experiment was done when it was that created a harmonic coupling 40 years later. That's all. I don't know for a fact that that was on the peak of the wave. He didn't say that. However, this wave is a subharmonic. It's only a subharmonic. The 2012 wave is much more powerful because we're dealing with ultimately a 26,000 year cycle. Don't say anything, man. I don't even want to hear it, all right? Um, then here's my question, all right? Uh, you can, and you can talk as long as you like. Um, you have a unique perspective on Edgar Casey. Edgar Casey. Yeah, I knew did. this was going to happen. Correct. No, no, no. It's the psychic I, I premonition, right? Dude, I ain't backing on you, man. No. <laughs> um, uh, 
Okay, so you see now you threw me off here. All right, so, so what was I talking about? Oh yes, 2012. The uh, the idea here is is that it's having a unique perspective on Edgar Casey. All right, Casey did. I think you correct me if I'm wrong on this. He did a grand total of I think only 14 readings that actually dealt with the future. Right, about 14 readings that did with the future. Yes, yes. Uh, and of those 14 readings, a lot of them were interrupted by his clients who were, you know, who said, I don't want to know anything about that. Just tell me if my partner's a crook and things like that, right? And Casey has been not only uh, amazingly pressing about what's going on, and his predictions have come true in a way, but not in the cataclysmic nature that a lot of people have expected. For example, he said true. that in 19, 1998 to 2000, that there would be a shifting of the poles, period, or the beginning of a new age. And it is interesting because there was a polar shift. Not many people know it in 98 to 2000 or so when the poles actually shifted. There's three magnetic north poles. And the pole actually shifted from one to another to another. If you're talking about Chandler's wobble, yeah. Yeah, Chandler's wobble, exactly. did happen. Uh, he talked about 1998, the, uh, uh, the Library of Atlantis, the beginning that it would be found. And, of course, in 96, there's an earthquake in Cairo that cracked open the Sphinx Temple complex. And we think that the tomb of Osiris might be the foyer, if you will, to what might possibly right. be the, the Atlantean aspect. So considering that a lot of Casey's predictions have been um, pulled down, so to speak, that have been softened by prayer and human action and, and what have you. And I'm not, I, you don't have to stick to that. I'm just, I'm just pointing out, because of your unique connection to this, the connection and the, what, what I am of interest, it, it, interest to me, we seem to have done so much work along the lines of the Mayan calendar, the harmonic convergence of 1987, meditations that have been done, 92, 94, earthquakes that have been lessened in California, um, I mean, working with the Prophecy Research Institute, when Gordon Michael Scallion was talking about the whole West Coast falling into the ocean and whatever else, and so many people did meditations in California, and then the call went out for people to start meditating, and, and I said, don't tell me what's the same, tell me what's different. And people began to realize that the future was not as dire as many of them thought. So 2012, again, I wasn't sure if there was a lot of prophecies, but if you could mix that with what your opinion is of what goes on in the next four years or so, because everything is beginning to condense. Everything is beginning to pull humanity back into that into the beginning of that quantum leap. So take us there and take it away. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Sean. Um, what I didn't want to have to dwell on is the reincarnation thing. Uh, if you're interested, you can go to my website, divinecosmos.com, and read about that. Uh, because I don't really think this is about individual personalities as much as it's about yourself. Uh, a lot of people have come up to any of us on this panel, I'm sure, and would like to have uh, us be the savior figure, for lack of a better term, and this, there's no mess, messianic return. It's a, it's a consciousness awakening that's happening in each person. And so if you want to get help from others uh, on your spiritual path, that's fine, but I would always encourage you to practice discernment and recognize that if a truth doesn't resonate with you, you can throw it away and not look back. Because as one of our panelists was saying, this is a future that we create. 2012 appears to be an energy field which is largely dependent upon our focus in terms of how we choose to go into it. Wow. Uh, and one of the reasons why we know that is because of the government time travel project I just spoke about in my workshop, which many of you are at, called Project Looking Glass. And it turns out that the person looking through the looking glass determines the future that you see by what they expect they're going to see in the future. <laughs> so this is an actual government Atlantean reverse engineered time viewing technology that has now confirmed factually, and I've had multiple witness testimonies that don't even know each other independently tell me this, that we are dealing with a situation where how you look at it does determine the outcome. So if that works for you, then work with that, because honestly, I don't believe that we're dealing with the cataclysmic reality. Uh, the Edgar Casey readings you spoke of, Sean, uh, were largely dictated by an entity that at the end of the readings would call itself Halaliel. And Halaliel was later identified by the people in Casey's circle as being a trickster entity, and trickster means negative. So this entity is responsible for the prophecies of California sinking into the ocean. Do you think if I believed that, that I would live in Los Angeles? Honestly. So <laughs> I, I'm not like you, though. I don't want to die until I'm ready. I, don't, I wouldn't get anything out of it, I don't think. But uh, no, seriously. <laughs> Seriously, uh, I think that... Uh, in, in David's defense, a lot of us get that, by the way. Dude, you live in Hermosa Beach. You know What are you talking about? You predict the future, and you live in Hermosa Beach. That's where the wave's going to wipe everything out. And I keep telling him, well, California's going to be all that's left, and it's going to be the rest of the United States that falls into the sea. So, you know... <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> That's right, man. Well, again, I, I want to remind everyone here that each soul, every one of you, is precious beyond imagination. And it's just such an incredible honor for all of us on this panel to be able to share this energy with you because as you tune into our frequency, there is a very real energetic conduit that is formed. And if we are clear enough, then our personality disappears and we become a lens for the Creator that you're shining to us to shine back onto you, hopefully with some transformation and some nice filigrees on it. So I wanted to share with you perspective on 2012, getting back to your earlier question, Sean. Uh, and this deals with the idea of what exactly is going to happen between now and 2012. And this gives me a great segue into a piece of information which is scientific in nature, which I've wanted to share at this conference, and this is the great time to do it. I was poking around in Russian physics. I was looking through the web for various uh, scientific studies done by Russians on torsion fields, which is the energy field of consciousness. And they've done some fantastic work. I quite by accident stumbled across the Russian Institute of Temporology, which means a study of the nature of time, and found a paper by a man named Dr. Sergei Smelyakov. <laughs> I know, I know. Go ahead and laugh, it's okay. <laughs> My coughs don't smell like anything, by yeah, the way, they're just say, roses. Say, yeah. But uh, Dr. Smelyakov, or we'll just call him Sergei, maybe that'll be easier. Or, or Smelly, as his friends call him. Or Sergei, we can okay. call him Sergei. <laughs> I think Smelly's better than Sergey. I think, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Danny, I don't want to tangent on you. I apologize. Um, okay, the point is this. Smelyakov looked at the Mayan calendar, found out that, does everybody know about the golden mean, the phi, 1.618? That's the harmonic cut, the sacred cut. You can cut a guitar string, and it'll be 1 to 1 1.618 is the ratio. Anyway, that's the basis of all life and all growth. If you take the Mayan calendar cycle, 5,200 years in length, and you start chopping that up by the phi ratio so that it implodes into a singularity in 2012, which means that if you have an imploding spiral, okay, you're cutting it by phi, you cut up 5,200, make that sacred cut, and then cut that unit and cut that unit, those cuts will fall on certain years. And what Smelikov discovered is that on those years, very, very substantial changes happen on the planet, including the fall of civilizations, the rise of new methods of measuring time, the rise of new civilizations, the rise of great spiritual teachers such as Jesus and Gautama Buddha, the major earth changes. In fact, the Russians did a 2,000-year retrogressive study of earthquakes and found that the biggest earthquakes happen on these resonance points. Well, think about what I said. It implodes into 2012. So what does that mean? Prior to actually hitting 2012, in the last year especially, there's going to be one after the other after the other. And every one of these wave fronts changes the planet, changes consciousness. One of the last ones we had was 1991, which was the fall of the Soviet Empire. One of the more recent ones that we had was right before, like two days before, the Bush administration invaded Iraq, which I believe was the political fall from the public will of power that they had. So we're dealing now with the next wave that's coming in 2009. As we head into 2010, 2011, they're going to start happening every couple months, and then they're going to start happening every couple weeks, and then they're going to start happening in every couple days. By the time we get to 2012, we're going to be hitting new ones every hour. And towards the end, it's, it's multiple times per second. Okay, now my readings have told me, for what it's worth, that some of us will be able to have ascended abilities I mean, full-on ascended abilities prior to the actual shift happening. So that would be very cool because what we're expecting after 2012 is a 100 times more harmonious utopian world where things like time travel, levitation, instant telepathy, instant healing, telekinesis are as common and as everyday as breathing. And I look forward to that time. Now, I've been told, I've been told that any one of us in this room, anyone, if you're willing to do your practice, which basically involves the acceptance and the forgiveness of the self, and if you get that down, then you start looking at everyone else. If somebody else upsets you, the only reason why they would is because they're hitting an issue that you have. So if somebody does something and it no longer is your issue, you won't be upset by them. If you can find that peace and that equanimity within yourself, then you will be the most compatible for this change that is coming. And as each of these new wave fronts hits, these are sufficient enough. They used to take hundreds and hundreds of years. They change the whole nature of the world and civilization. They're going to start happening every week 
and then every day. So you can harness that potential in yourself, and I see a very, very positive future coming. So I thank you. Forgive Bush. Yeah. <laughs> Already done it. <laughs>